We're, we're here for Yamasakura. And why right. is that important? Why is Yamasakura so important? Well, there's a variety. First of all, there's a variety of reasons this is important. Let, let me start off with a couple of things. But first of all, our relationship with Japan, both militarily, politically, and economically, is huge. This partnership, this bilateral exercise between our two militaries is essential, and it's one of the biggest operational exercises we conduct. It's also part of our rebalance of the Pacific, part of prevent, part of shaping, part of winning. And then the third part of this, it builds the interoperability we need with our Japanese partners. This is the first time in Yamasaka, and we've been doing this now for over almost 30 years, where we actually have a true integrated bilateral command post. And what you see when you come into our COIC, our Combined Operations Information Center, are Japanese and U.S. soldiers not working separately but together, but actually together as one organization. This does a couple of things. It helps our training and readiness with our Japanese partners. More importantly, between myself and General Asobe, the Eastern Army Commander, we achieve shared understanding and the ability to make shared decisions together, which has been instrumental in moving this exercise forward. Okay. And uh, what is First Corps' role in Yamasakura? Great question. Our role is we're here as a Joint Force Land Component Commander. Uh, so Corps right now leads that Joint Force Land Component Commander and I am that commander. General Sobe is also the commander of the Eastern Army. So you have two Joint Force Land Component Commanders working side by side. We have an integrated staff here with Marine, Navy, Airmen, as well as civilians, Guard and Reserve, and he has brought his headquarters together. Together we're fighting one contiguous operation against a threat uh, to, work, uh, to look at Japanese collective defense and how the Japanese can reassert their sovereignty. Okay. Um, what are some of the difficulties uh, that we've come up with or that, that, that we've come across? You know, in it, it's interesting you ask that because in the past we would start these exercises right here from Japan. But the Japanese started earlier with us, and we started this planning back in March. Uh, we've been at this for over five months now, to include the Japanese coming back to Joint Base lewis McCord for the Rampex, sending their J-3 back, sending their staff back. So we've been integrated since that Rampex a few months ago. So while sometimes there are challenges in terms of culture, there's challenges in terms of language or in terms of processes, I think we've mitigated a lot of that from day one. So from day one, we've been having discussions on operational challenges, vice exercise challenges advice how to do things. It's actually about how to conduct operations together. So I'm very comfortable with how far we come, and more importantly, how far we're going to continue to go as we increase the interoperability of our two forces. Okay, and what do you think the focus is for this year's exercise? I think the focus of this year's exercise is a few things. First of all, as we said earlier, is to achieve shared understanding and decision making between the two commanders in a bilateral way. More importantly, the Japanese are looking at integrating new capabilities into this exercise this year, such as amphibious operations, such as the use of air, such as the use of cyber, such as the use of how to conduct operational sustainment and operational fires. So this is much different this year because the exercise is taking on a much more joint nature. It's also taking on a civil military piece with the integration of political impacts in terms of Tokyo as part of this operation and the impact it has on Japanese decision making for its political leaders. Okay. And um, what do you think the value is of conducting um, <laughs> these kind of exercises? It, it, it's immeasurable. When you put forces together like this, you cannot measure the impact on readiness. Now there's two aspects of readiness. First of all, we're achieving a certain modicum of readiness with the core headquarters being out here. Our readiness and our ability to be expeditionary, project combat power, and to assert ourselves from mission command has extremely increased during this exercise. But the readiness of our forces together to operate in this environment, to do the rehearsal, to do the reconnaissance, to build readiness is essential. And if we're going to partner with the Japanese in the future, which we will, whether it's NEO, non-combatant evacuation operations, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or contributing to their collective defense, we are ready to support them. And the last piece, and probably the most important piece, is the trust you build because you cannot surge trust. So the trust we're building in the terms of this partnership and the relationships we have with the Japanese military is something that will, have, will be beneficial for me, but more importantly for all the leaders that are junior to me that will continue this in the decade to come. Okay, so what about numbers? Like how many U.S. and Japanese people are coming together? To he has about a little over 4,000. We have about 2,000 U.S. service members, and I said those span all the services as well as the Guard and Reserve. And we also have some civilian support. For example, I have a political advisor from the U.S. Embassy here in Tokyo, mm -hmm. which has been essential and very helpful, as well as some interagency play. Okay. Um, 
when you said there's a, a lot of you said there are some guard and reserve components mm -hmm. out here helping the YS. What what are they doing out here? What do you, what do you have? Uh, they're doing a variety of things. Some of them are part of the JFLIC, the Joint Force Land Component Commander Staff. Some of them are working exercise control, and some of them are integrated in the JTF, the Joint Task Force, that provides the overall mission command for the exercise. Okay. And by the way, Eighth Army is doing a magnificent job running that JTF headquarters. Okay. So we're very grateful to them for doing that. So um, how would you describe the, the leaders and soldiers of the Eastern Army of Japan? Uh, the Japanese soldiers are some of the most professional, disciplined, motivated, and well-trained soldiers that I've experienced in over 30 years in the military. You know, when you talk about engaged leaders, the Japanese leaders are engaged, their soldiers are motivated, and they really exemplify what we in the Army talk about in terms of character, competence, and commitment. Uh, so I'm very happy with what I see here, and they're excellent role models uh, for our soldiers. Um, and as far as uh, you said, U.S. service members are working side by side with uh, Japanese military. So how is that working out for, for the individuals? Let me, give, let me give you an example. We just left a briefing with General Sobe on future operations. You know, what happens in the next 24 to 48 to 72 to 96 hours. The plan that they built for General Sobe and I was a collective plan between our two G3s. So in that plan were integrated systems of U.S. and Japanese capabilities. And then the decisions that were briefed to General Sobe and I were done collectively by the two staffs working together. So the guidance that was put out was the same guidance that resonates throughout the U.S. and the Japanese forces, which is tremendous when you want to conduct bilateral operations. So that's a way you bring the two teams together, by looking at bi one bilateral intent, by looking at one bilateral plan, but more importantly how the two staffs have cooperated and worked together so that you don't create a seam between the two countries that can be exploited by the threat that you're facing. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, that, that Yamasakura is part of a pre prevent shape win strategy. So how does that fit into the Pacific rebalance? Well, I think as far as the Pacific rebalance goes, uh, the core right now is the operational arm of United States Army Pacific has put a lot of energy right now in terms of making sure that we stay engaged with our partners uh, to build partner capacity and to build theater security cooperation with our partners in the Pacific. So this rebalance does a few things. First of all, it avoids miscalculation. It de-escalates conflict. It builds the trust we need to have with our partners. You know, 80% probably of what we do in the Pacific right now deals with humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So how do you build those relationships for the future? It enhances our readiness. It enhances our ability to provide timely support. So what we've been able to do here with our Japanese partners is to facilitate not only what the Alliance is asking us to do, but future operations that we may have to do together. I think that's it. Let me look real quick. If there's anything that I missed, I think we, I think we got it all. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add, sir? Well, first of all, this is the first time I've done this, the Yamasakura exercise. And uh, I just talked to General Sobe in there with the staff. Uh, you know, we're on day two of the exercise, and I could not be more pleased with some of the discussions we're having on operational readiness. And I could not be more pleased with the way our teams are working together. You know, and the Japanese talk about maie, which means one team. And I think the beauty of this exercise is that we are coalescing between the Eastern Army First Corps and all the subordinate elements that are here from the total force to truly be one team. So uh, my thanks to General Sobe, the Japanese leadership, not only for their hospitality, but also how they've accepted this bilateral exercise to make both our military stronger. Thanks. That's it.